Hello and welcome to my latest sci-fi author chat. I'm J. Diane Dotson and today I have with me Gareth L. Powell, award-winning British sci-fi author. Welcome, Gareth. Hi. <coughs> so Hi. Yeah. we're just going to keep this a nice casual interview and talk about all kinds of things, about your influences, about your background, and about some of the things that you love and some of your current works and some upcoming works that you might want to share. So we'll just jump right in. And I'll give an introduction from your website. Gareth L. Powell is an award-winning British science fiction author. He is best known for his Embers of War and Macac Macac trilogies. And he has also written numerous short stories, novellas, and even turned his hand to screenwriting and comic scripts. Recently, Stampede Ventures and Whip, am I pronouncing that right? Have I partnered to it partner to adapt his Embers of War novels for television, and he will act as co-executive producer for the series. So that's pretty spectacular. Congratulations. Thank you. And Very so we will talk about that for sure here in a minute. And so I'm just going to get started and say, when did you know or at least suspect that you wanted to write science fiction? Um, I think I was probably about four years old. Um, I grew up watching so this is that would be about 1974 75 um i grew up watching star trek on my parents old black and white tv and it was i think it was probably the first time it was shown in the uk um but i just i didn't understand most of it at that age but i loved it um and i kind of made up i had a um a, sm a small dinky toys model of the enterprise which fi fired little plastic pellets. Uh, I've still got it. I've still got it in the back room, actually. Um, and I used to make up stories with that. So, um, and then when I was a bit older, so probably about eight, nine, I started writing uh, in a sort of spiral-topped reporter's notebook my big space epic, which was very um, what's the nice way of saying ripped off um <laughs> very heavily influenced by sort of star wars and blake seven and that sort of thing so it was uh it went off and i wrote and then when i finished the notebook that was the end of that novel and then i started yeah. a new notebook yeah the, the sequel and i, I wrote filled i think i went through three or four books there and that yeah what would I'm we have done without those spiral notebooks because that's exactly what i did <laughs> I, I'm somewhat relieved they've been lost to, to time. Uh, <laughs> no, I'd love to read them, but, you know, they could at least be fodder for amusement, if nothing else. But you never know what you'll find in the old stuff, right? Yeah. So when you were growing up, obviously, Star Trek played a role in your influences and Star Wars and Blake 7. And what would you say have been your greatest influences in science fiction books? shows film or writers oh so many um i think the original star wars film kind of was one of the the, the sort of road to damascus moments because up until that point space travel had been like star trek it had been clean it had been antiseptic the crew was all kind of well disciplined and in star wars the main character was a kid from a small village and I was a kid from a small village um, and who just wanted to go off and have adventures and so did I and then um, but the future wasn't clean it wasn't just bad alien of the week standing in front of a styrofoam rock it, it looked real and it was um, it was used and scuffed and somehow that made it more believable and um, yeah, I think that really that really set me off. And then uh, the, the movie Alien, yeah. which I saw, saw when I was far too young to see it. Uh, no, around no. Of, Back in well, the day, that's how we Gen Xers lived. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh, yeah. Which I, which I, I, I really, that. it's a such a well shot movie. I didn't appreciate it that is. when I was younger, but going back now it is. Mm -hmm. um, that that movie i think it kind of it frustrated me in that the aliens are quite scary and then at the end they suddenly turn around and they're nice 
and I kind of wanted it to continue with them being a bit scary. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so um, then, of course, I saw Alien and Aliens, and it was that scuffed future again where everything's a bit dented. It's, you know, the people there, they're not like super capable Captain Kirk's, they're just people doing a job. Um, right. And I think that kind of aesthetic really fed into, especially like Embers of War. Oh, absolutely. That, yeah. They're they're just people doing jobs in you know, and the spaceships are their workplaces as well as everything else. So it's it has that kind of vibe to it. I think those two things um, probably are the biggest influence on my. Um, I can't think of another word for aesthetic, but that's I don't want to sounds a very pretentious word, but on my kind of my kind of vibe in in the books. Whereas I think. Um, William Gibson's um, short story collection, Burning Chrome. <coughs> yeah. Excuse me. Um, that was that book really, I read that when I was uh, mid 20s. <laughs> and that was, you know, I'd been dithering ar- around about writing for, for years. And that book was like, holy shit. <laughs> That's it's, the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, Hey, I can I could do this, and it was because it wasn't science fiction about presidents and governments and things. I had no idea how they worked. It was science fiction about just people on the street, and I could do that. And it was that that was a big revelation, and it tied in with those t- movies that I mentioned as well. That kind of used future thing. So, yeah, I'd say that that pretty much wraps up the influence. Yeah. Well, that segues well into talking about Embers of War, which, you know, I'm about halfway through, and I, it's just the only long-form fiction I've read since the before times. And I, you know, through my own process of grief and stress, you know, I just wasn't able to read fiction, but I would slowly read yours. And what I find I'm really loving about it are the conflicted feelings of the different characters, and it's a lived-in place. These people are battered and scarred. Everything around them is sort of a post-war with the underlying unsettling feeling of, uh-oh, you know, things are afoot and I don't, don't know how it's going to end. It's, I haven't finished it. You know, we won't spoil it, but I'm particularly fond of Trouble Dogs. So can we talk about Trouble Dog for a minute? Yes, of course. So the Trouble Dog is a sentient warship that basically got her heels in and refused to go along with the status quo anymore. And I just find that fabulous because you know it's what you, it's what you're made to do if you're this you know a sentient ship and this trouble dog's like no i'm done with that scene absolutely not and so i wanted to talk about what inspired you to write trouble dog that way um yeah i mean i i, I thought long and hard i mean we're talking about influences i mean obviously parts of the book are, are quite influenced by um Ian M. Banks. I'm very yeah. kind of fond of those kind of the, the sassy spaceships and uh, and so on. So I, I wanted to write her, but I kind of, I had to think if you designed a warship, you wouldn't give it a conscience because that would be not very useful and you wouldn't want it to refuse orders because so these warships, they're kind of built on cloned human brain cells but there's like canine dna in there as well to enforce loyalty and pack loyalty and there's lots of artificial processes and stuff but at the core there's like a few grams of human brain and the thing is that because of that she gradually developed a conscience um it was like a flaw um that she wasn't designed to so she's come out of a, a dreadful atro- atrocity um, with this new conscience and she's she's resigned her commission but she's still got all this inbuilt programming to blow stuff up and to to kill things and so she's struggling between her it's, it's the classic struggle between what I feel compelled to do and my instinct and my conscience so I really like that you're just kind of you know everybody has moments of gray instead of black and white and, and she's for sure in there just but, but also she, she's only like 14 years old so she's yeah. basically yeah. a teenager and she's teenager. got all, 
yeah all that teenage stuff that we all go through of like volatility and uh, yeah but where do I fit in you know what's my place in the world what's my purpose what do I do what am I going to do how do I react to you know how come everyone else seems to know what they're doing and I don't and that whole kind of so I mean she was a joy to write because that's that's such a lot of emotion and 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 conf, internal conflict which um, I think that's you know I find every time oh it's a trouble dog chapter I'm like yes what what's going to happen next because I I kind of feel like because of her struggle you know I just really don't know what's coming next with her and so it's really a lot of fun I love trouble dog and so I'm glad I'm happy you wrote that character slash ship so it's extremely fun but you we're talking about emotions but when you talk about science fiction, the science aspect of it, you know, how do you research the science of your science fiction? You know, do you have sources, you know, do you have a background that sort of plays to that? How do you go about making sure it makes sense? Um, I try to make it plausible. Um, obviously, you know, in order to do that, I have to invent different kind of hyperspace you know right. so i've invented these higher dimensions and but they're all misty and strange and physics doesn't work there properly but um just to get around you know how do you get from one star to another quickly so um i can't claim any strict scientific basis for that but i try and make it sound plausible and sound like it works and um in the way that i think if i was writing a modern novel and a character ran out of the house, got into his car and drove off down the road, I wouldn't spend half a chapter explaining how the car's internal combustion engine worked. They would just, you no. know, so, so I kind of try and take that approach, whereas the characters take some things for granted, so I don't have to explain them, and the reader can kind of see how they work by what what they do and what happens. So it's like, oh, that's how the ship gets there and, and so on. So. Yeah, I think it's a really nice blend of, you know, making it feel like this is a natural and normal thing that people do by driving down the road. We don't need to know those nuts and bolts. I mean, you definitely do make it seem plausible. So kudos. So let's get back in, if you don't mind, into Alien and Aliens and that sort of lived in and scruffy, scruffy looking. Um, lean back into Star Wars for a second. Uh, life, you know, and and, I definitely feel that with your characters too. Your writing is is really unique to me. It's 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 contemplative. It's 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 digging into a place that a lot of writers of any genre can't quite go. And and I can't really figure out how you do it, but it's amazing. But I definitely think that you're having that lived in and scruffy and flawed situation is 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 definitely part of the secret you know and I love it and so let's talk a little bit about those films like Alien of course it's sort of a haunted house in space situation and you know the bottom line is the dollar you know with Waylon Yutani at the end of the day wants another product that they can kill things with you know another bioweapon and these guys are just on you know and two gals are on this giant ship you know and then go investigate you know what eventually is called LV-426 so and then the nightmare that happens from there and the final girl, you know, of Ripley. But I always, always, you know, one aspect of, of that movie that fascinated me that I want to talk about a little bit is, is just the just sort of jaded feeling that everybody has like, stop, you know, how much is this going to pay me? Or, you know, are you going to, am I going to get my bonus, you know, for this yeah. bull crap? What are we stopping for? You know, I want to go mine my stuff and get my cash, you know? So I wanted to talk a little bit about that before we move to Aliens, which is, a different flavor in that same universe yeah i mean the the scene that always comes to mind for me in alien is when uh ripley is down in in the bowels of the ship talking to the two mechanics yeah and there's that steam hissing out the pipe and they go what god can't he and then as soon as she walks off they just reach up and turn it off yeah. um and it's that kind <laughs> of um it's a great scene yeah you know anyone who's ever had to deal with a, a corporate it department can relate to that um Absolutely. and it, yeah it's but it, it perfectly captures that kind of that workplace stuff that these people don't all get on they're not all friends like the crew of the enterprise they are just colleagues doing their time doing their shift um and they have their internal bickerings and their you know 
distrust and they're all basically there for their you know they're their bonus as you say so it's yeah. um, quit griping yeah. as you know one of the you know with the cane that said that to lambert quit griping when they're on their way to the ship yeah, yeah and it, it's it's just like uh, you know that there's some history there you're like you know obviously they're comfortable enough with each other they don't they can say that but they're also like i'm really done with your crap you know just but that i think is genius because that's what makes yep. the film more interesting that's why we're on the side of those guys because they are just okay. working grunts whereas you know if it was like leslie nielsen from forbidden planet they're yeah. a sparkly, yeah. sparkly silver space adventurer exactly. yes <laughs> but you know that's a brilliant film but he's you it know, is. If, if, if um it was a square jawed space adventurers going down there to, and they find a monster and fight it. It would have been, I think, fairly dull. It's because these guys are working stiffs and they don't have any expertise at all. And th this monster suddenly intrudes into this reality that we can em empathize with and kind of imagine ourselves as part of. That makes it scarier, I think. Yeah. And it's, it's extremely relatable. And, and, you know, having that, the corporate entity being essentially evil. The end of the day too and so that then, then we shift over to aliens which is more sort of the you know gung-ho you know militaristic sci-fi but you have ripley back kind of brings them out of their normal routine it's like no you don't know what you're getting into this isn't just a bug hunt which is you know a whole interesting little side conversation that hudson's like you know the bug hunt you know and you're like oh another one so you guys are used to this you know but this one's obviously different and they're in over their heads and, and don't really believe Ripley. But at the same time, there's this tension between that you've got Burke, you know, the, the company man, and then you've got the military people, you know, the colonial Marines, and then you have Ripley. And I, that's a really interesting triad of, you know, alliances. And at first, nobody seems like they're going to jive with anybody, you know. Oh, you, you know, have uh, his culture, Snow White, you know, stuff like that. You have the uh, the replicant as well, um, right? Yeah, that's a whole another issue because of what Ash did in Alien. So her yeah. distrust, and that's a nice reversal, I think, in that film of yep. their relationship. Um, but that film is is a masterclass in ramping up tension because, yeah. you know, from the first shot, I think when, you know, that light comes on through the window of the escape pod from the first one yeah. and you don't know what it is you know is, is are these more aliens is this you know what's going on and the, the thing goes up and the harpoon gun from the first one is still stuck in the bottom of the door and it comes in and then it's just some salvage guys like it's it no it's not a rescue party it's just some guys like oh she's alive there goes our bonus and, <laughs> another bonus out the door yeah. out the airlock <laughs> But from there, it just, it ramps it up because it plays with our expectations. And I think, I mean, was it 45 minutes or an hour till we actually see an alien? Yeah, it's a while. There's all that, you know, there's there's the going through the uh, the corridors, there's finding Newt, there's, and, and it just ramps up and ramps up. And then once the aliens are loose, it's just a chase. Yeah, and then you can't stop. But then you've got this um, amazing thing that this nuclear reactor is going to explode. Yeah, you know, that that's you know, and it, you it, and then Ripley's going back for new, and then the dropship gets caught. You know, she gets up, it's gone, and then it comes back, and then it gets. I know it's that railing. distrust is back, and she's like, oh, you know, and then it yeah. appears, and you're just like, oh my god, you know, I screamed when I saw that. Yeah. Back, I'm like, run for it, you know. It's just so in that moment, it's so yeah. stressful I, that. And then they're not going to get away, and then they do. And then they get up to the ship and then rah, and there's the final boss fight that you weren't expecting and it's just it, it's Incredible. fantastic fantastic uh, you know i think one of the best crafted action movies um oh my god yeah, yeah. no doubt absolutely yeah. um and it it was very i think for its time having ripley being the action hero uh was you know you know she, um you know she wasn't just like a young pretty starlet or anything right and she she was believable as you know she fought through all this stuff and you said um and she, she you know yeah fantastic movie um there's been a huge influence on me I, uh some friends and i snuck into the cinema when we were 15 <laughs> um, 
and watched it on the big screen and it was probably one of the tensest <laughs> two hours of my 15 year old life but i came out and i loved it absolutely became obsessed with it so well i honestly think i think you're destined to write something in that universe and i hope that you do so related to that like what what would be your dream project to work on in science fiction oh gordon um <laughs> there are so there are so many i mean i I'd, I'd love a chance to write uh sort of for marvel that would be oh know, yeah I'd be reading marvel comics since i was a little kid and you know when the first the first avengers movie you know that was to me that was just i was eight years old again watching that it was just fantastic yes. um you know i don't know there's so many there's doctor who would be fantastic i would love to see if you were on doctor who <laughs> yeah I've, you know i've been watching doctor who since tom baker um yeah um <laughs> alien godzilla Ooh, yeah star wars yeah yeah so so that brings me to, you know, can you talk about Embers of War and, and its development at the moment? You know, it's been optioned, like what stage is it at uh, in terms of? Uh, the, the current state of play, as far as I know, is that uh, a script exists, uh, which I have read and which is brilliant. Uh, and um, the, there's a director attached. Uh, which is Breck Eisner, who did uh, The Expanse. Awesome. Uh, several, several episodes of The Expanse. Um, awesome. you know, and so, you know, it's all the producers are there, the studio's there. Um, at the moment, we're just waiting for a network to sign on the dotted line, and then it will go into production. Fingers so. and toes crossed. Hope it happens soon. I really hope it does. Yeah, it's, uh, I've actually known about this. They bought, they optioned the right to the book after the first one came out. So ah. I've not. I've been kind of sitting on this for like two years and it's just like <laughs> your poker waiting. face is next level. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's one of those things that I've just been, you know, here any day now for two years. So it's, um, I'm trying not to, to get my hopes up till right. I actually, you know, I don't think until I actually see it on the screen, I'll quite believe it. But. What a good feeling though, to be this far off and which is pretty impressive. Mm. And which brings me to my next question. So you're, you're writing scripts uh and so some screenwriting and do you can you talk about what your goals are there um i'm just diversifying really um yeah. find, finding other projects to do the um guy who wrote the pilot of embers of war gary graham um is a great bloke and he and i have been tossing ideas back and forth with the idea of pitching a couple of pilot episodes cool. um, to networks and then seeing if we can get somebody to pay us to write them so it's uh yeah it, it's at the moment it's kind of two guys just taking a shot but it's uh it might lead somewhere yeah i mean you gotta shoot your shot and it sounds like you've got quite the pedigree and resources behind you so again good luck with that so what else are you working on right now like uh, are you so you've just recently released some books and you want to talk about those and what's coming to in, in the near future? Um, which ones? What's come out recently? Oh, yeah. This year, the um, there's the 10th anniversary edition of my novel, The Recollection, which came out from Solaris, which is very good. Um, I can't believe it's 10 years ago, but it's um, it's lovely to see it out again because I don't it didn't get sort of quite the exposure I think it needed when it first came out because um, I was fairly unknown um, but I'm very fond of it and so I'm glad it's uh, I'm glad it's getting another shot hold on I'll just grab a copy of it oh great there we are wow that's a beautiful cover it is isn't it it's uh, yeah. so uh, yeah I'm, I'm, they've I think they've done it to kind of match in a bit with the with the embers oh, yeah. covers yep um Definitely. Yeah, so it's, um, but I'm glad it's getting, it's, That's it's brilliant. Up there. Um, because there's, you know, it's, it, it stars another talking spaceship who's definitely an ancestor of the Trouble Dog, I think. Oh, well, um, that would be loads of fun. Yeah. Um, 
What about Light Chaser? Can you talk about a Light Chaser? That's another project. Of... Yeah, I don't have a copy of that to show yet. Um, Light Chaser is a novella coming out in August from okay. Tor.com Publishing, um, which I co-wrote with Peter Hamilton. Who... Peter Hamilton, okay. Um, so, for... Light Chaser in August, very cool. What else yep. is happening? What else is happening? Um, I'm contracted to write another two novels for Titan. Okay, so great. I've I've written one of them and I'm about 20,000 words into the second. Outstanding. They're both space operas. They're set in a whole new universe. That's exciting. Um, and they're, although they're set against the same background, they're not really sequels. They're standalones. Okay. Um, they have some characters in common, but it means readers can jump in at any point. Um, so that's good. They're set in a... Uh, a timeline where human beings got, get kicked off the earth <laughs> uh, around about 20, uh, 20, um, 75 mm. for uh, generally causing mayhem and trashing the environment. Okay, um, like human and a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and an alien race comes down and basically evicts us for the good of the planet. Um, but they're merciful, so they give us these big space arcs to live in. And set us on our way, on our merry way, as long as we promise not to go fucking up any more biospheres. <laughs> Sounds like a bit more than we deserve, but you know, I can see there being yeah. trouble. So that's very so cool. It's, yeah, it's kind of like a sort of uh, Ian Banks culture novel mixed in with a Battlestar Galactica novel. It's oh, kind, of, that's fine. That kind of vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it goes a bit annihilation towards the end. So, mm, intriguing. So, when can we expect the first of those? Or is there a timeline yet for the first one? The first of those was supposed to have been published this February, just gone. Um, but because of the lockdown and, as you say, inability to read, I had a little bit inability to write, so I didn't deliver the manuscript. You know, I delivered it four months late, so they bumped it. To next year so it'll be next february and then Great. the other one the february after <laughs> um outstanding so let's talk a little bit about you know we've talked about alien which is sort of sci-fi horror we've talked about aliens which is sci-fi action uh so there's some sub-genres going on and do you have a favorite sub-genre of science fiction that you either have enjoyed or that you would like to dig into more that you haven't yet um, you mean in fiction? Yeah. Um, yeah. Science fiction, like say sci-fi horror, sci-fi action, sci-fi fantasy, any of that that you want to dip into that you haven't yet? I, I don't know. I mean, I've written six or seven space operas. Um, so maybe um, inclu including Light Chaser. So um, I kind of feel maybe a... a time for a bit of a change up but I'm not quite sure in what way I mean I wrote the the macaque trilogy which was kind of near future alt history thriller um in there and then I changed up to, to space opera so it kind of feels like I, maybe I just need to change gear a bit as well so I can come back to space opera a bit fresh all right uh, yeah. later I mean I wrote while I was writing the um embers of war trilogy I wrote ragged alice which is a um, a detective novella set in, in Wales, which is obviously very different. I think working on something so different kind of helped both projects. Yeah. Cause it so hopefully, um, yeah, my agent wants me to write some more novellas. Um, Great. Um, and think about a novel. So I'm thinking at the moment, possibly I might venture into fantasy. So That would but, be amazing with your prose and your world building. I could see you yeah. Killing it, but it would be it wouldn't be a kind of Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones affair. It would be um, it, uh, the the grim dark holds no appeal to me because my characters are a bit, you know, flawed. Uh, yeah, troubled. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what would happen there, but that that's definitely something I'm considering at the moment. Very fun. Well. I'm excited for that. I'm excited for all your new projects. Um, so like, 
you talked about a little bit about how it's been hard to write, but on a good writing day, what would you say, you know, what's your, what's your typical productive writing day like? You know, we're, we're talking process now a little bit. And for those of us who are in that process, it's kind of helpful to identify with other authors and how you operate. I think my best ever writing day, I wrote about 5,000 words in a day. That's um, amazing. That was my best ever day. Um, usually, if I write a thousand, fifteen hundred, I'm very satisfied. If I write five hundred, I'm fairly satisfied. So, yeah, it's um, yeah. 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 The point is to get it down. Is what I always try to say. Just get it down. You know, try not to get too bogged down in the numbers. Yeah. You know. But you know, you know, if it's five hundred good words, then that's 500 words closer to the end so that's right yeah it all counts so that's yeah. so okay so you know what's your favorite do you do you have a special drink or do you listen to music or what, what do you do during your writing you know what do you how do you get into the groove uh, a huge mug of tea um and i have a writing playlist on spotify that's like 25 hours long or something of um, classical music and, and film scores and, and um, sort of Brian Eno ambient music and stuff. So I, I can stick that on or if I'm feeling very sleepy and that's making me sleepy, I stick on like a YouTube um, video of coffee shop noise. Oh, it's, it's it's a, like a, that you miss being in a cafe, right? Yeah, and it's for some reason that kind of low level background noise helps me concentrate i don't know why it just seems to screen out the uh the, the distractions or whatever and it just helps me focus yeah that sort of gentle clinking of some of the cups and saucers and the drone of people talking and maybe some music that's sort of blended in it is unique and yeah. and i do find that even though i tend to write in a silent atmosphere i can write pretty well at a cafe for some reason like you know if However, if I'm here and there's like lawnmowers and dogs and wood chippers of doom and leaf blowers, my enemy, <laughs> I can't, I can't do that. That's not my background noise. So I'm ready to get back to cafe writing too. Yeah. Well, I've, I've um, bought a set of noise cancelling headphones. Oh, yeah. That's just a must have. I think, yeah. what can you do, you know, just to get through the spring summer sounds of nature destruction the battle against nature every day <laughs> uh, i also find um sound of waves on a beach helps as well same kind of yeah. white noise effect that just kind of it just for some reason it just stops your mind wandering so much because yeah so maybe a writer's retreat is in order as things open up huh yeah absolutely i, I did one in the end of 2019 with two writer friends we hired a a cottage up in the uh the welsh marches and, wow um not entirely sure if it was in england or wales it's that kind of vague border zone um but it was literally there were two cottages on this lane and the lane was miles miles from anywhere oh. um and, and we just the three of us sort of sat in there and wrote from morning till night and took turns to cook an evening meal and uh not like living a dream yeah yeah that it sounds was, fun it was really good so, yeah i was there's a fun one i'll just throw out so like how would let's talk about you know like later on you got your void conf test to the thing which between being a replicant and a human so what's the one thing that would tip people off to your being human or not like let's start with the human part how would people know you were human um cut me do i not bleed um <laughs> it's um i don't know i don't think you could i don't think you could make an artificial beard this awesome yeah that's true it's a pretty spectacular beard <laughs> yeah, cool. also, I, I can't I do think, it so i'm impressed i think if a replicant we probably would have uh, engineered out all the gray hairs creeping in as well so. see and that just wouldn't be as cool yeah so, so as for not how do we know uh, you were? Um, I don't know. I'm uh, fairly um, idiosyncratic in some ways, so um, I can also be fairly um, far from reality on occasions. So, a dreamer. 
yes, yes, o always have been kind of like one head in the clouds. So. Do androids dream of electric coffee for tea? Mm. <laughs> um, um, uh, well, hello, who's this? That is Toto, and he's just come <laughs> in out from the rain to show me how wet he is. Oh, Toto, thank you. That was a beautiful little oh, photo bomb. See, I, I love it when people have, I can't have pets and you know, I'm renting and there's no pets. So I always get a big kick out of seeing people's pets. So hi, hi bye Toto. Uh, he's got a twin brother as well. And they're both like, they're, they're four years old, but they're both little kittens at heart still. Oh, so when they're wet, right. they sort of come into me and go, dry me off. Oh, well, they must love you a lot. So I expect me to lick them clean and dry and warm them up. And it's just like, no, shove off. Ah, they're your, they're your, they're teammates, they're crewmates on the ship that you're running. So, well, but they're not Jones. But let's talk about Jones for a second from Alien and Aliens. He, I don't know. He, <laughs> he doesn't have such a big role in the, uh, um, in the second movie. But yeah, um, staying home is probably a good idea. Cause enough trouble, you know. So. Yeah, but he, I think he. He, Sorry, he very much is as a cat character. Like he, he just yep. sits there, and watches somebody get eaten by a monster. You know, like, well, it's not my problem. It's not coming after me. You know, but he might be taking my food. Like the whole thing. I think it's hilarious, and I've talked about this before with other writers. You know how the xenomorph goes from being, you know, this little bitty thing to this giant creature within like a day or less than a day. Even I don't even know the time frame of that, but. What do you think that thing did? Did it get down in the food stores or is that just some other the, unexplained thing? The mass must have come from somewhere. So Yeah. I think, mind, mind you, it would have been, you know, if the, when it was a little alien and it, it was stealing food out of Jonesy's bowl, I think Jonesy would have fucked him up. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I'd like to see that, that cat fight. Yeah. <laughs> end of story, end of movie. <laughs> oh, well, so that couldn't happen. But, um, so let's go into some writing advice. Like, what's the worst writing advice you've ever received? Oh, I had quite a bit. Um, <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know. All advice kind of works for some people. Yeah. Um. So I can't say. You know, if personally, I can't. I want to write every day, but I can't, um, you know, real life gets in the way and so on. Parenting. Uh, yeah. So I yeah. get a bit, you know, when people insist you have to write every day, it's like, no, you don't. Um, but some people find that works for them. So I can't say that's bad advice because it works right. for some people. Um, hmm. I don't know. I once had feedback from an editor. Um, on an early story I submitted, he sent me a four page, four pages of A4, um, handwritten on both sides, uh, about how awful the story was because I'd used uh, double exclamation points instead of a single exclamation. Oh come on! What? Which which was which was a hideous Americanism, apparently. Um, I know. I'm like, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, it was yeah it, it was I mean it basically boiled down to I would have written it a bit differently um but there was just this you know one entire page was about how experienced he was as a writer um but maybe it should have been about how biased he was yeah he'd only ever published stories on his own website so oh well that's a bit different yes so uh yeah so that that was a very very strange response to get so yeah well on the flip side of that what do you think is the best writing advice you could give to someone starting out uh, read read everything you can in your genre read widely outside the genre read good books and find out you really drill down and think what is it that makes them good for you what is it that works for you um and then read books you hate and work out what it is about them you hate 
yeah. and just try and isolate those ingredients. Because if you know, for instance, I really love books where this happens, then that's going to help you when you're thinking of writing your own book because you're going to write a book you love because it's got these ingredients in it that you, you like. And the reading will help you see how people have described like spaceships, space, you know, all of this stuff. So you're not just coming in, clomping in with a load of cliches or things that have been done many times before. Um, you know, you, you, you couldn't, um, you know, it, it's always embarrassing when sort of a, a mainstream author will announce their new marvellous work of speculation that they've done. And it's something that, was a cliche in science fiction 40 years ago and it's but they they've not read in the genre they just come you know crashing in with this amazing thought um what if robots could think and yeah so you know read read everything you can to avoid that um yeah and the more you read the more i think it puts your brain into writing mode it puts your brain into kind of fiction mode and you can kind of it, it, you start thinking in in kind of fiction whereas I think a lot of the time if I look if I look at because I paint as well I look at a lot of art and then I go outside and I look at the sky and I'm seeing the clouds as brush lodges and things because my brain is thinking in art whereas if I'm reading a lot my brain is thinking in fiction so it's, that makes um, sense and you do artwork like me you know or you're both a writer and an artist so it's really fun to see do you think it gives you a mental break from writing that helps you know helps you come back you know, feeling refreshed and, and fresher and with a different perspective, if you maybe kind of feeling a little bit tired, you know, do you think it yeah, it's, it's a little just bit? A, it's just an escapism thing for me. It's it's yeah. doing something um, more productive than sitting on social media, um, yeah. but it's doing something that I can relax, just relax and just, you know, it's it's relaxing. It's just um, something to do. It's, it's uh, I've only started posting up um pictures on instagram fairly recently but um slowly getting better slowly getting the hang of it so. yeah and that's true with any skill that we have with writing and art you know consistent process helps us get better at it so and people can find more about you and your works at your website and on social media and your handle is at gareth l powell on both twitter and instagram yes so yes so is there anything I haven't asked that you'd like for readers to know or that you'd like to talk about? Oh, I don't know. Just um, read books, <laughs> read lots of books, and especially read mine and, um, and Diane's. So. Thank you. And I, I can't recommend enough Embers of War, and I can't wait to see where you take your other stories and if they'll be on screen, I think it's a win, not an if, and I can't wait for that. And I'm so excited and happy for you. So thank you. And thanks for coming on here for the Sci-Fi Author Chats. And I hope to interview again soon and talk about new and exciting things soon. Thank you. All right, well, we'll wrap this up. So thanks again, Gareth L. Powell for joining us today and at Astra.